Hey, it's Alex from Voiceflow, and welcome to this case study series. Together, we're going to learn a blueprint for making real-world AI solutions with conceptual lessons about everything, from evaluation to building and deployment. And by the end of this course, you'll be able to apply this framework to your own use case by identifying a problem that AI can help you solve, getting started, improving your agent, and bringing it all the way to production ready. And you'll learn how we put theory into practice by developing a case study for a Q&A chatbot for Hack the North, the largest hackathon in Canada, where an AI solution answers participants' questions automatically through Slack, integrating lots of real-time data, maps, insights, and more, both to innovate and improve the participant experience, as well as to reduce the strain on organizers during the event who get hundreds of questions. Let me give you an idea of what the final solution looks like. So from Slack here, we can ask any question we want, like, what is Hack the North? We'll then see that the bot will react with a bot emoji saying that it's pending an answer. It's going to do all the AI logic in VoiceFlow, and then it's going to give us back an answer in our Slack thread. So here we see the answer came back. We can read it, a really long answer explaining what Hack the North is, very thorough. And then at the end, we can give some feedback on if it was good or not. Let's say, yes, this was a great answer. But now let's ask a little bit more of a strange question about where the activity with fish is. This one isn't found in our knowledge base anywhere. We actually don't have any activity about fish. So the AI is gonna get a little bit confused here. As we can see, it wasn't able to find any specific information and tried to give us a general map, but it didn't really know what it was doing. On the other hand though, this project supports adding information in real time through announcements. So we can go to the announcements channel and saying, hey hackers, the fish activity is being hosted on the third floor. Now, the AI will append and add that information to the voice flow knowledge base. Now though, if we go back to the questions and ask the same question again, it'll actually be able to tell us where this activity is happening. If we look in the thread, we can actually see that the fish activity is being hosted on the third floor. Make sure to check it out. And it even gave us a map of the third floor. Well, here it's not really a map of the third floor, but it would be once we have it filled out. The AI can also handle emergencies. Let's say you cut yourself. It's not going to give you a stupid answer. Here it's giving you some basic instructions on dealing with a wound, but also giving you some resources to call 911 or campus security. It's also notified organizers through the extensive monitoring system that exists in this Q&A tool. So here, if we go to Q&A monitoring, we can actually see the questions I just asked we can see that the what is Hack the North question was answered, but that when I cut myself, it actually sent an emergency detected notification to organizers. This gives us great visibility. From here, we can also go look back at the thread, or we can look at the voice flow transcript to get a better understanding of what's going on. Where here we can see the actual question and answering process it did, or we can even look at extra analytics that are stored in Airtable. So we can do post event analysis of the performance of our AI solution. Here seeing, answer success, answer scores, and user satisfaction. This series is especially useful for builders and leaders who really want to focus on making real-world production-ready AI solutions. And watching this will help you both prepare and develop your own solution. There are three important phases to building your AI solution, and we'll cover each of them in their own video. The first will be about evaluating and planning your solution and all the things you have to think about when it comes to AI. The second video goes into the development process to deliver the Q&A chatbot you just saw a demo of, including the architectures being used in these AI solutions and the process of slowly building up your interface and your AI agent, looking at some of its different versions, some of the common challenges I encountered. The third and final video is about deployment and iteration and goes into the QA process, collaboration, and experimental results we've had in the process of getting this agent ready for production. So this core video series will look into the process and case study of developing this project. But if you're interested in a full technical walkthrough, I've recorded a one and a half hour guide that'll also be in the video description. It goes into all the workflows, all the steps, all the nitty gritty of the VoiceLab project and of the Slack code that's running it and can give you some instructions to get started running it yourself. But anyways, video one about evaluation and planning. This video will look at the first phase of building AI solutions, evaluation and planning. I'll walk you through five steps in the planning process for an AI solution, and each time looking at how that went in the Hack the North Q&A chatbot case study. 
So those include, first of all, identifying problems that AI can help with, and then once you have a specific problem in mind, defining a clear solution for it, then how you should go about choosing a technology that actually fits your solution well. And then once you have your problem, your solution, your technology, it's time to make a clear plan. Finally, we're gonna go through the process of presenting an AI solution to stakeholders that might not be used to it, as well as how to establish good timelines for this kind of project. This video, and actually the entire series, is made for builders and leaders who want to build real-world, production-ready products. This case study series is actually really powerful because it isn't just a proof of concept like are shown off in lots of other VoiceFlow's videos. This is actually a production-ready agent that'll be deployed at Hack the North this year, an event that I'm helping organize. So let's get straight into the first part, identifying a problem. So we obviously don't wanna make a solution and then have to find the problem that it fixes. So let's take a look at how inside your organization you might think about what kind of problems AI can help solve. There's two main ways of finding these problems. Either you're a team that's tasked to use AI to innovate or make a solution or optimizations, in which case you can directly go seeking out the kinds of problems that you know AI is good at solving. Or you can learn about AI through content, videos like this, or articles online, and then have it in the back of your mind day to day until one day you see a problem and now you know that AI can actually help solve this one. So AI is especially good at solving certain kinds of problems. It's really useful for dealing with common cases the core 80% that can be anticipated and prepared for well, which will pay itself off simply by the sheer quantity of actions that it can automate. This includes both answering questions, but also taking actions like tracking orders, changing statuses, or updating databases and things like that. Next up are problems that would be really good for retrieval augmented generations, which include finding and reading large amounts of documents to then give an answer based off it directly. And finally, there's using AI to increase engagement and interactions inside a product. Um, this is often relevant in e-commerce scenarios where you're gonna give recommendations, for example. So, in the Hack the North case, one day, a couple of organizers and I were discussing an issue. We spend all this time writing a handbook for participants to read and learn about the event. But since it was so long, very few participants actually read it. And instead, they would flood our organizers with questions that were answered inside the handbook or other similar content that we have made for them. And on top of that, we would regularly be answering the same questions over and over again, like what's the Wi-Fi password? What's the Wi-Fi password? What's the Wi-Fi password? When we would prefer just being able to answer a question once and then have other people find that answer more rapidly. So overall, that's the problem. And looking at the types of problems that AI is good for, this fits well into retrieval augmented generation and automating for that 80% of common cases. So, now that we've found our problem, what does our AI solution actually look like? And clearly defining a solution comes with five big questions. The first one, pretty obviously enough, is what does our solution actually do? How does it address the problem that we have? In Hack the North's case, the solution is to be answering participants' questions about the event automatically. That's what we want our AI to be doing. It's not answering questions before the event, and it's not answering internal facing organizer questions. We've defined a scope of what it'll be doing. Next up, what's the form factor for our AI solution? This is sort of where are we gonna put it? Where do people interact with this? Could it be on a website in the bottom right hand corner? Could it be a number that you can call on the phone and talk with automatically? In our case, we decided to use our event Slack so that there's a questions channel and it can be answering inside this questions channel in threads. That's a very organic way for our users to interact with the AI solution. And it's important for you to think about where the solution can fit into your customer or user's journey so that it's effective and organic and natural and easy to use instead of being out of the way. Because in Hack the North's case, having a phone number to call would be really inconvenient for participants and they would just revert back to the old way of answering questions and we would have done a whole lot of work for nothing. The next question is what kind of data are we working with? Especially in this use case, we want to be answering questions. We need to both think about the data that we're going to use to generate the answers and the data that we're going to use to evaluate and test. So in our case, to generate the answers, we can use all our written content we generate. So that's the pre-existing handbook and the FAQ sheets. But we also identified that to be answering all the participants' questions, we're going to need to be collecting more information, like maps, menus, schedules, and things like that. We also decided that announcements could be fed in dynamically so that's some more data that we're getting real time, as well as hooking our agent into our real time scheduling API. On the data to test and evaluate our solution, 
we actually have archives of questions that have been answered in previous years. So that's what we can be using to be testing. Now, every scenario will be different, but it's important for your organization not to overlook the data requirements, both on the generation as well as on the testing sides, because that might often be a difficult thing to collect, and that can't just be engineered away with a smart solution. The next question I have is maybe a bit more nuanced, but it's actually how are we answering? Are we answering users in one shot or having a back and forth conversation? There's pros and cons to both, and even at VoiceFlow, we use both types. Our in-app assistant, Tico, that's in the bottom right-hand corner whenever you're on a VoiceFlow website, that's a back and forth conversation. It has memory and you can follow up on your questions so that it has contextual understanding of what you're talking about. On the other hand, on our Discord, we automate answering questions using a different version of Tico that tries to give the best answer it can in one shot. There's pros and cons for both methods. Having a conversation can be a more organic back and forth. It's a more classic solution and it can let users get more information out of the bot by being able to clarify their question. On the other hand though, Running conversations is much more technically complicated, both on building the actual AI agent itself so they can have memory and contextual understanding and be able to take advantage of the follow-up messages, and when it comes to your interface and the infrastructure that has to be running your AI solution. On the other hand, giving a single shot answer will require more careful prompt engineering so you can really get the most out of the one answer you get to give back from the user at interpreting their question as broadly as possible, collecting as much information as you can to give them one perfectly packaged answer. But this does make the solution simpler to make and simpler to use for participants. And an added bonus is that having one-shot answers reduces the chance for abuse or exploitation or people trying to break your bot because they have less opportunities to find cracks or trick the AI. So in Hack the North's case, we went for a one-shot solution as a prototype to keep it simple and safe. But for a subsequent version, we could definitely try improving our agent by having a back and forth conversation. It's important to note though, that in certain use cases, and especially ours here, it's not extremely simple to switch back and forth from having a one-shot answer versus a conversational answer. And it changes a lot of how your product will actually be designed when you're making a plan. So make sure to pinpoint this and be aligned as a team on what you're going to go with. The last important question is what are the success criteria and how are we gonna measure them? Are the measures gonna be manual or automatic? quantitative or qualitative? What kind of interactions are we gonna be analyzing? And here you have to think of both technical and business outcomes. So for this Hack the North case study, we selected first of all satisfaction through a reaction button that users can use to either say, yes, this was helpful or no, I need help. Accuracy of answers through both manual review and marking if they're good or bad, as well as automatic answer scoring to see how well is the answer formatted and how well does it answer the user's question. We're looking at speed through the time to answer, especially comparing that with the manual answering times for organizers looking at historical data. The kind of conversations people are having so that we can improve our agent iteratively. If we see lots of people are asking about a certain topic that we don't really cover, for future implementations, we can make sure to include a specific section that's handcrafted for that and check for that in our quality assurance. And then lastly, the business metric we need to look out for is cost. How expensive is this agent to run both in infrastructure as well as in tokens through our AI system. So all in all, through these five big questions, we've been able to pinpoint some important information about what our solution will actually look like. I strongly recommend that if you're following along with this guide to make an AI solution, you ask yourself similar questions or think about other kinds of questions that you want to answer about the overarching solution that will have an impact on what it looks like in the end. Next up, we have to choose what technology we're gonna be using to bring our AI solution to life. In the AI space, there's lots of options when it comes to the how of implementing a solution. And we'll walk through a couple common methods as well as why you might wanna use them. Starting off with manually making API calls to LLM and other AI service providers like OpenAI, Cohere, or Anthropic. This gives you absolute granular control with the requests you're doing, but requires an insane amount of overhead when it comes to all the code you're writing to interface with them, even if some of these providers have their own SDKs, which makes building agents with prompt chaining, more branching paths, and complicated integrations more cumbersome to develop. Next, you can use Langchain. Langchain is a software development framework that enables creating AI agents by connecting large language model providers with external data sources, tools, and your own code, 
and provides a lot of abstraction on what's actually happening. Langchain can be really nice to get started with, but can start to bog you down as your AI project becomes more complex due to all of its abstractions. And because of this, has fallen out of favor of lots of companies that are using AI to make real projects. As this article says, Langchain was helpful at first when our simple requirements aligned with its usage presumptions because it's very opinionated. But its high level abstractions soon made our code more difficult to understand and frustrating to maintain. And plus, it doesn't make it especially easy to build and especially to understand large agents because of its limited visual designer. On the other hand, you might consider using automation platforms like Zapier to build your AI products. Zapier is a tool that automates creating workflows by connecting different apps and services and can be integrated with AI to trigger actions and data flows across platforms without the need to write a lot of your own complex code. Building AI automations with tools like Zapier could be effective for making simple email recap system or a question answering system like the one we're studying in our case study. But services like these lack the agent building and AI features that are required to make a product that scales and becomes a lot more complex. This is where a platform like Voiceflow can come in. Voiceflow really shines as you build your agent up from a single step to a slightly larger agent up to a huge and advanced system, giving you more control of your agent's behavior at every step along the way. It brings both the convenience of a low-code tool when it's appropriate, like for when you're laying out your conversation diagrams and want to visualize branching paths, while also letting you write your own custom functions to integrate with your own proprietary services or to build custom interfaces to deploy your Voiceflow product using the APIs. Voiceflow also provides you with the common tools that anyone building serious AI agents needs, like the knowledge base, which is ready out of the box, but can be customized to your needs by editing things like the prompts or other settings. So to contrast, where platforms like Zapier are automation platforms with AI capabilities, Voiceflow, on the other hand, is a platform tailor-made for building advanced AI agents that can then be deployed anywhere you want. Looking at our case study, Voiceflow is also a really good choice because of all of its collaborative features. We're working on a team here with multiple different stakeholders who need to be able to understand both the behavior of the agent, but also change the information in the knowledge base or make updates on the fly. So after having considered all those options, that's why we chose to make this Q&A chatbot experiment with Voiceflow. Okay, so now that we've answered this important question, let's work on making an effective plan. I'm sure I'm gonna skim over this section a little bit, not because I don't wanna share details with you, but because this really depends on a case-by-case -case basis and how you want to be running your process. I'll be showing you how we did at Hack the North. The first thing we did is work on developing a product requirement document, or PRD. This document outlines both the vision and the reasoning behind the solution. So sort of recapping all the problem we identified before, the solution we identified and the big questions about it and concretizes them in a bunch of requirements we need to be developing in this product. Here on screen, you can see an excerpt of the PRD we wrote for actually developing this Q&A chatbot project. One thing to note here is that in your PRD, you're gonna have different level of priorities. So here, the two ones I have on screen are both P0. These are mission critical, essential to have for the actual product to work. So obviously this includes basic things like building a Voso project that retrieves from the knowledge base and implementing a Slack interface for the chatbot. The product doesn't really exist without these requirements, but we need to write them down to clearly explain how they work, their intended behaviors, any edge cases we wanna handle and things like that. At Voiceflow, we always recommend having different priorities in your plan, especially when it comes to the actual development of the AI project itself, because you wanna be building in a crawl, walk, run process. What we mean by that is you just start up with something that's really simple at a crawl level, maybe just a couple steps, a simple knowledge base. Then once you're more familiar with the tool or you've proven that the project is viable, you can increase its complexity a little bit add more specialized workflows, add more information, add more advanced knowledge-based lookups, hallucination reduction, abuse mitigation. And then once you do more experimentation and more advanced features, you can go up to a run level and make an even more advanced bot that is able to maybe take actions or have back and forth conversations like we talked about before that might be a bit more complex. So let yourself categorize the ideas you have for your project into these different buckets of crawl, walk, run, and also leave space for adding improvements later or other new ideas that you think of while you're working on the project itself. 
it's important to get started with building something to know really what direction you want to go in because you're going to learn a lot while you're building. The most important thing that this document should make extremely clear is how the solution solves the intended problem down to the nitty gritty of how it should behave. This is really important to have so that your entire team from developers to stakeholders are aligned on what this project is going to look like, especially because AI solutions like this are a newer technology that people might not be used to working with. So now that we have this product requirement document that outlines how it should behave or the features it should have, we can work on making a technical plan. Are there any compromises or design decisions we need to make? The product requirement document is general enough that it explains the intended behaviors, but doesn't lock you into certain implementations. Now when you're making a technical plan, you need to decide what's gonna go where, how are we gonna do it, what's the order we program things in, how you split up your developer resources and everything like that. This is also very specialized and depends on your own organization standards. But in our case, we followed our usual project development procedures. So here important questions were how are we going to deploy and post this and getting a good understanding of the Slack framework we're building with that we can properly understand how we're going to develop the interface and what things like buttons are going to look like, the kind of messages we can do, the kind of events we can listen for so that we can make sure that we can fulfill the vision in the product requirement document technically. So to give you a concrete example here, one of the requirements of the Hack the Nerf project was that organizers should be able to insert announcements into the knowledge base dynamically to add more information to the bot's uh, repository of what it can answer about. The problem technically was, how do we make sure that it's only organizers adding information? We have to look a little bit into how Slack permissions work, how the organizer permissions would work. And in the end, we came to a decision that we would actually take advantage of Slack's messaging permissions to limit this. So only top level messages can be added as announcements because in our announcements channel, organizers are the only ones who can send messages there. So if a message is sent there, it must be a valid message. So technically we don't need to be doing any analysis inside the Slack bot to check permissions. So that's handled just by the platform we're using Slack. And there's a thousand other questions you'll have to answer as you make your own technical plan. And then the last little thing here, which is making a diagram to lay out the ideas and see how everything's going to work together drawing all the connections, which really helps developers and just the entire team understand how information is flowing, what's gonna be where, what information are we connecting and uh, intended behaviors. So you can walk through everything that should happen and make sure that what you've technically planned aligns again with the product requirements and the overall vision. Now onto the last part of this process, which is presenting the stakeholders and pinning down some timelines. AI is still a relatively new technology and while many stakeholders might have played around with tools like ChatGPT, it's really useful to try and have a hands-on demo they can play with to get a better idea of what the project you're pitching to them is all about. Voice was actually really great for this with a built-in prototyping tool. If you've never used it, you can just go to the top left-hand side of your canvas and choose to share a prototype, and then you have a handy link to send to your stakeholders they can play around with your project and get sort of an idea of what it's gonna look like in the end. This can really help with getting people on board and it's always amazing to see their reaction to a project that's actually working. Even if it's a very, very basic prototype, it really helps sell an idea. Also, since you did a great job preparing your product requirement document and technical plan, it's gonna be much easier to have a clear pitch of what your project actually entails. That being said, you'll have to go back and forth about the technology itself and be ready to answer lots of questions about the AI technology, especially around what's possible and what's not and how certain things might work. Common questions include reducing hallucinations, redacting personal information, trying to break bots, cost, and other metrics. So have some answers prepared for them. You will most likely have to go back to your product requirement documents and some negotiations to make some changes. Here in the Hack the North case study, during the presentation and negotiation phases, we actually added more monitoring of what the AI agent is doing as a requirement for increased safety, established some topics we might want to stay away from or how we should handle emergency scenarios, and some requirements about not leaking too much sensitive info and mitigating potential abuse from participants. Once you're done doing your presentation and your stakeholders are on board, the last little thing you need to do is pin down some timelines. This depends a lot, again, on your specific use case, but some common criteria are how much development needs to be done, how much experience your team has making AI solutions with voice flow and the complexity of the project. And these timelines will go in different phases, right? Because if you're following crawl, walk, run, it's gonna be much faster to make a crawl 
then the time it will take to improve to walk and to run. So you might want to set a goal of, hey, we're going to get these priorities done by this time. In the Half the North case study, the timelines were technical planning and preparation over three days, development over a full week, full time, with one full developer, which is me, and with contingencies for up to two weeks of development time, and then leaving an extra week for QA phases and iterative improvements to the actual project itself, which leaves us with one month until the actual beginning of the event to make any changes, have some overflow room, and collecting the information we need to feed to our agent so it's ready to tackle the questions day of. And bam, now we have a clear and actionable plan for what our solution will be, how it solves a problem. We're sure that it's technically feasible and our entire team is on board. Evaluation and planning is definitely time consuming, but it's super valuable to get started on a good foot. That being said, don't let yourself get stuck in planning paralysis. With VoiceLow, it's easy to start playing around once you have a basic idea of what you're going to be doing. And playing around for prototype can give you and other members on your team a better idea of what direction you want to go in with this project. So to recap, here's a slide that goes over those five big steps of planning and evaluation and how the Hack the North case study actually answered them. And I recommend that if you're planning on also making an AI solution by taking a look at this case study series of videos, Take a screenshot of this slide and see how you would fill it out given your scenario. If you enjoyed this video, the Voiceo YouTube channel has a couple more videos on planning and business-focused information for building AI solutions, like the great 15 KPIs for Gen AI. The next video in this case study series will be looking at the development process, some challenges encountered, and a deep dive with a couple of the features that were developed. This video will look at the second phase, developing the actual code for your solution. I'll walk you through the paradigms custom AI solutions built on VoiceFlow usually follow, the process of both building the actual VoiceFlow agent and the Slack bot that goes along with it, and taking a look at some of its code. Then we'll look at some of the challenges we encounter along the way and how we dealt with them, and then finish with an in-depth look at some of the code and setup for some of the most important features of this solution. So the first half of this video will be more a presentation about the development process, and the second half will be going through some details of code in real time. But here's a quick run through of the case study so far. So Hack the North gets a lot of questions from participants during the event that could be answered in documents we already give them. We identified this as a problem that AI could solve with retrieval augmented generation and voice flow with an agent that can answer questions on Slack with a one-shot answering approach. We spent careful time writing a product requirement document and a technical plan, and then iterated and negotiated with the stakeholders to make improvements and add lots of security features to our bot and now we're ready to program. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so the first technical thing we'll look at is a little bit of a recap of the architecture and the paradigms we're working with with this VoiceFlow project. All VoiceFlow projects will obviously have to have a VoiceFlow agent that's actually running the AI process, an interface that you're interacting with, and then some external services or knowledge-based information that you're actually using to run the logic of your agent. So this can be either calling your own proprietary APIs, calling databases like Airtable, or uploading documents you have prepared in advance. So here, we can take a look at the architectural diagram that's prepared for the Hack the North Q&A chatbot project. It looks a bit chaotic, I agree, but we can see things segmented between Slack the platform, the Slack bot in the middle where everything's running through, Airtable, VoiceFlow, and our Hack the North Hacker API where we're getting scheduling information. So important things to note here in our architecture is that we're following a one-shot answering approach as we talked about in the first video of the series, which means that there's no actual state inside the bot itself or database that we're reading from. With the tiny little exception of sometimes getting a little bit of information from Airtable, we don't want to be relying on that for our architecture of our bot. So walking through what's here a little bit, generally we can see that things start with Slack where users send messages either in questions or the announcements channel. They then get sent to the Slack bot in the middle of the diagram. Then once we're there, the Slack bot will pass information to VoiceFlow. VoiceFlow will determine the question and will answer it. The answer will then come back to the Slack bot, will be saved as a transcript, will be sent off to Airtable, sent to monitoring, and the answer will be given to the user. On the announcement side, the announcement just directly passes through the Slack bot, is added to the knowledge base and to Airtable, and then an acknowledgement goes back to the announcements channel. One important thing I want to point out here is where are we interfacing with external services? Here are the two big external services we're working with, our Hacker API for scheduling information and Airtable for storing logs and analytics. When you're making an AI solution with VoiceFlow, you need to decide 
is my external servers going to be interacted with from inside voice flow or through my interface or my own custom code that is hosting the main solution? So here we actually use both. Scheduling information is retrieved from inside VoiceFlow. We actually have a VoiceFlow function that is then calling Hacker API for schedule and getting an answer back. But on the other hand, we decided that everything that is Airtable and Analytics will be handled by the Slack bot. It would be equally valid to also handle the Airtable and Analytics through VoiceFlow itself, but we decided to do it like this because more of the information we wanted to be storing in the Analytics was related to the messages and all the information on the Slack side rather than what's happening inside the voice flow side. But what we could even do is interface with Airtable through both. We could upload partial analytics from inside voice flow and upload some more information from the Slack bot if we wanted. But in the end, it's up to you to decide where you want to be interfacing with your external data. So now that we have an architecture laid out, let's take a look at the actual development process. So the first thing I did in my development process was make a very long list of steps I needed to do to fulfill all the features I had to develop. I just made this one in Notion. So since we know we're going to be building with Slack, we better get started with that. So for this project, we're going to be using the Bolt framework made officially by Slack exactly for developing applications. And then we went to the API section and made our basic app and got some credentials for it so we can add it to a workspace to be testing. Then I followed Bolt's get started guide to make the basic boilerplate that I needed to have my bot be able to just echo back whenever a message is sent. But it did confirm to me that it's working and it was actually not a lot of code to just get it set up. And here we can see it actually working inside of Slack. At just the start, I was saying hello and it was echoing back with a ping. So that's great. Now the Slack interface is up and running. The next thing I did is set up a very basic voice flow agent. If you didn't know, you can look at the history of backups of your voice flow agent from the settings and backups tab. And from there, you can preview old versions as well as download them. So here we can actually see a preview of one of the first versions of my voiceful agent. All I did was capture user's reply and echo back. And then we can see a little bit lower that I got it connected to my Slack bot and it was able to echo from voice flow. So that's responding, hi there, echo. This is testing if voice flow gets my answer. That's exactly what's happening inside the voice flow bot. I was able to connect that using a little bit of code that I wrote. So here's an example from my actual end product where I had this voice flow interaction function and I'm able to call the voice flow APIs from inside my Slack bot to be able to send a request and interact with my voice flow agent and then get its response and parse it. We'll be going through all the exact details of how this code processes questions in the second part, but all you need to know here is that I have set up a voice flow interaction system and now I'm able to get a basic back and forth between Slack and my voice flow bot. So now that this groundwork is set up, I can focus on improving my voice flow agent. We know that most of what we're going to be handling here is knowledge-based type queries. So that's what I put my attention towards first. So here's the next version of my bot, where I'm getting a user's reply, looking up in the knowledge base, and then if it succeeds, I'm going to tell them the answer, and if it doesn't succeed, I'm going to tell them, hey, I wasn't able to get it. You can also see at the bottom that I added a comment explaining how I want this knowledge-based lookup system to work, and I added a couple custom actions at the end to denote if the answer was a success or a failure. We'll go more into those in the analytics they provide in a second. Next, I worked on fleshing even more out my knowledge-based lookup system. I knew I wanted to prioritize announcements, so I wrote some custom functions for that, had some moderation set up to make sure that users aren't trying to break my bot, and at this point, I had a pretty built-out KB lookup step. But I knew I wanted to use it in lots of different places inside my voice project. So I turned most of this into one little component, which brings us to what we have here a quite simple looking knowledge-based lookup step that actually has two very powerful components, both in the announcement lookup here with this component diamond and in the ability to score and finish. So by this point, I had put a lot of work into iterating and developing the actual voice flow agent itself. And now I started work on adding actually a couple more workflows for more specialized tasks that I wanted my agent to be able to do. So let's take a look at these now and at the final stage of the entire bot. So from my voice flow project here, we can see I had a couple different workflows. So home is the most basic one. It's for knowledge-based lookup. We also have emergencies, judging, locations, and real-time scheduling. Let's start off with taking a look at the home step, which is the main knowledge-based part of the agent. So from here, every conversation starts with telling the user we're ready for the message. That's because in our Slack interface, right, the user is speaking first, but in voice flow, the agent always speaks first. So we're just going to launch a conversation and then throw away its first answer and then capture our answer from the user. And then we hit our smart announcement knowledge base component. This component is actually really powerful. 
It's that big diagram that I showed before of some knowledge-based lookup steps. The way it works is, first of all, there's a moderation step that just checks if the question is relevant for an AI to be answering. So this avoids jailbreaking or malicious attempts from participants trying to break our bot, and just uses an AI set step to try and evaluate, is the answer good or bad, give an output, and then go down a path. So if it's not relevant, we're just going to say, hey, I'm not able to answer that, and then go down this stop path. If it is relevant, though, we're then going to go to a step that fetches announcements. So this is just a way with voice flow, you can actually call your knowledge base using the API. And calling with the API is really powerful because here I'm able to actually only fetch documents with a tag equal to announcements. So this lets me make sure that I'm only looking up announcements. And just for some context, our bot is going to be able to take announcements sent in Slack and actually add them to the knowledge base to have more up-to-date answers that are more factually correct. So we want to be prioritizing those over other older documents in the knowledge base, especially because some of the announcements might contradict past information. So it looks these up and just does a little bit of processing and formatting. So it gets the time of the announcement, makes a nice string out of it, and adds it to a list that is easy for the AI to handle. So this is what the announcement lookup does. But then in here, it will say whether it succeeded or failed to find some documents. If it succeeded to find some documents, we might not know if they're extremely relevant documents. So the next step we just do is ask the AI, hey, here's a list of documents we got. Are they relevant or not? And if they are, we'll keep processing them. And if we're not, we're just going to fall back on a basic knowledge base step to just look up any information we have and then send it back to the user. If we did find some announcements that are relevant, though, we're then going to specifically look up non-announcement documents. So using a similar method here, we're looking up documents with a tag that exclude announcements, so to make sure that we're not getting announcements. We're going to store that also in a variable. And then we're going to tell the AI, hey, we have these announcements and some previous text. The announcements might contradict the previous text, and we want you to take into account the announcements is most important and give one final answer for the user. So that's what's happening in this long prompt here. And don't worry, it took me a long time to write this prompt and iterate on it. I mean, I definitely recommend that you iterate too to have a good balance of the kind of quality of answers you want to get out of your agent. Here it just puts a special focus into making sure that the answers are long because we only have one shot to give an answer. So we want to make sure we're fully answering the user's question. You'll notice here that the exit actually has a last set step. This actually sets a variable called smart KB success to either true, false, or stop, depending on how this smart announcement component ran. So obviously, if we had to abort early because it's an irrelevant question, it's going to set the variable to stop. If it succeeded, which means either finding a document in this step or it means having a synthesized answer with announcements and old information, we'll set it as true. And otherwise, we'll set it to false if it wasn't able to find any documents. This is useful because from inside our voiceful agent, we're then able to go down different paths depending on how the component ran. Because by default, components only exit and continue down to their next step without having conditional or different branching paths. So having a variable that you can reference to know which way to go is really useful. By the way, this whole template for the Voiceo project will be available in the GitHub linked in the description below. So after this, we're just going to speak out the output of this smart knowledge base lookup. So that's just a text step here. And then we're going to score and finish. So this score step just gives an AI score to the quality of the answer. Taking a look at some of the other workflows, let's look at real-time scheduling. This one gets information from Hack the North's Hacker API to supplement answers with up-to-date real-time information. This is because there's a ton of scheduling information for the event, and we found that if we just upload it all to the knowledge base or give it all to the AI, it gets a little bit overwhelmed. So what we're doing here is actually really cool. We're going to be using some JavaScript to extract the current time. Here's just some testing stuff because we're not doing the event, so it would break otherwise. And then here we have an AI prompt that gives an AI the expected schedule of the event as well as the current time and what the user is asking to determine when it should look in the schedule. Should it look in the past? Should it look around now? Or should it look into the future? Then, based on its answer, we're going to go down different paths. And we're actually going to call our Hack the North Hacker API with different time windows. So here, we actually have a custom function that calls our own API. Here's the link. And here's some GraphQL that we're sending to the API. And I think this really showcases Whistle's versatility when it comes to integrating with whatever service you want. You can even integrate with your own proprietary services. Once we got the answer, we're actually just going to send it to an AI to generate a scheduling answer. And then we're going to use the same knowledge base lookup to look up any past information that might also be helpful. And then we synthesize it together 
into one big answer if something was found in the document lookup. So there's a big prompt here that just tells the AI like, hey, you're gonna mix these two parts of information. And if there isn't any older information found, it'll just directly spit out what the scheduling answer was. Same way it'll score an answer. So we can see here that by using different workflows, we're actually going down different paths and doing different processing to give our AI answer. A similar thing happens for locations, where if we have a location question, we're actually gonna look it up in the information and knowledge base like we usually do. We're gonna send it out. And then we're gonna use AI to determine a map that we should give the user. So that we can have different types of maps, like an area map, an outdoor map, a sponsor map, a sleeping map, and then things like that. And then based on the type of map it selects, it's actually going to send an image to the user to augment the answer. So this is again another way we can upgrade the behavior of our agent by adding visual information other than just text. The last one I'll go into now is the emergency system. This is just so that if anything is going wrong or something that the, either the AI can't answer, a participant is hurt or something is going wrong, we're able to give them a more structured answer, not looking up in the knowledge base, just giving them maybe some emergency contact information and then telling them that organizers will be on their way to help as soon as possible. So all of these different workflows are actually powered by VoiceFlow's intent system. We've created a bunch of different intents for what the user might want to be asking about. And each of the different workflows is triggered by a different kind of question. So now that in the development process, we've really fleshed out the behavior of our agent, we need to populate it with content. This is where you want to fill out its knowledge base of a bunch of useful information you have. Here, for example, I uploaded some past documents you've had from previous Hack the Norks, like our hardware tool information, judging instructions, a welcome booklet, and some FAQs, as well as adding a bunch of announcements that lets us really see our agent in action. And then we spend a little bit of time modifying the sim prompt for the knowledge base lookup just so it's a little bit more consistent and aligned with what we wanted out of it, like not giving markdown and giving long and clear answers. After this, we went back to the Slack bot to improve its interface a little bit. So you can really see the alternating between Slack, working on VoiceFlow, working on the Slack bot, working on improving the VoiceFlow agent to be more complex, and then coming back to the Slack bot to make it more powerful. So here, now that we added images to our VoiceFlow agent, we need to be able to handle them from inside of Slack. So that happens in this part of the code where we're actually able to add attachments to our message. So we're checking for traces that are visual and that are images, and then we're adding an attachment with the image URL sent from VoiceFlow. One thing of note here is that when you're working on a custom AI solution made of VoiceFlow, you're going to need to handle these different kinds of traces differently. So here, text is very basic. We just add it to the message output. But images we need to deal with differently. And if, for example, you wanted to add buttons or carousels, you need to make a decision on how you're going to show those in your interface. And that will come out through some conditional code when you're iterating through the traces that you're getting returned to look for text or visual or here custom actions like answer. Um, just so you can handle them properly. For a deep dive technical walkthrough of all the reasoning and logic behind working with this, you can find a full walkthrough video that's in the description below. The last big thing I did in the development process for this MVP was do a refactoring of the project just to make it all clean before quality assurance and I get some code review uh, because the structure of it wasn't that great. It was more like one or two files. But after that, I wrote a little readme and it's going to be ready for code review on our GitHub. And you'll actually be able to download this project um, on the GitHub linked in the description below when it's fully open sourced. Here's also a few other tips on using components, templates, JavaScript, and functions in your VoiceFlow project to build something both really powerful and build quickly. So here in my project, I'm actually using components in a couple of different ways. So components is really powerful because it lets me rerun the same steps and blocks, but from different parts in the code. And if I update the component once, that update is represented everywhere that it is used. I'm using them both for the knowledge base lookup and for the scoring and finishing, which just has a little bit of AI prompt engineering and I want it to be consistent between my different workflows. So now with these components developed, I actually made some template elements out of them. So you can think of template elements more like copy paste, but they're really powerful if you're gonna be building a large agent. So here, this smart knowledge base lookup, actually it always requires both the component that does the actual lookup and this conditional step that goes on the branching paths. So to be able to have the consistent block, I actually made a library element called knowledge base lookup that we can use here. And it has both a fail and pass path. And then if it does pass, it automatically speaks out the answer. So this just really speeds up the development flow and helps me keep things consistent. I also use library components for the answer fail and for the answer success ending outputs. Um, because those let me have a consistent formatting for the action that says, hey, 
something came out well. Another thing I make use of inside my project is both JavaScript and custom functions. They're both useful for doing different kinds of things. A JavaScript step on its own is really useful for just doing some slightly more complicated variable assignment than you can do with a set step. So here I have some super basic JavaScript that just makes a debug message out of a string of variables. But we also using JavaScript in other places, like for example, inside the scoring and finishing, we're actually getting the AI to give its reasoning and then give a grade in a certain format. So it's a squiggly grade colon a number and then a squiggly. And we want to be able to extract that well. So there's no need to write a whole big function for this. We're actually just able to use some simple JavaScript with regular expressions um, to match for this grade and then extract it and then assign it to our answer score variable. So this doesn't need a full function. But on the other hand, functions are useful for some things. So here we saw three functions that I'm using. We saw the Hackenorf scheduling lookup, which does use quite a bit of code. It formats a GraphQL query, has to do lots of processing, which we wouldn't want to do from inside a tiny little JavaScript step, especially because we're going to be reusing this code in multiple different places. In the end here, this one was used three times inside the real-time scheduling um, for those three different time windows. That's why it's useful to have it as a function because it's larger and reused. Similar thing for the functions that were used for the announcements and non-announcement lookups. That's just because we want to be doing some processing and we're going to be calling an external API with more parameters than we want to do with a basic either API step and then some JavaScript after. It's just much nicer to put it in a nicely wrapped function and that you can just work with easier. Okay, so now let's take a look at a couple of the challenges we encountered during the actual development. So the first of them was the issue of how we're actually going to get the user's question. This might sound like a little bit of a dumb challenge, but it's less obvious than you might have expected. Normally, voiceful conversations happen with voiceful talking first, then getting users reply, then giving an answer. The issue arises that in our scenario, it's actually the user starting first. The user will send a message in Slack, and we need voiceful to instantly answer. Then we ask ourselves, how do we get that question to voiceful best? My first idea was that since we didn't want voiceful to have a turn first, we can send some information with the launch payload, which is what you actually send when you're starting a conversation inside VoiceFlow, and then have it handled that way. So if you didn't know, like I've shown on screen, it's sort of this top part. When you send a request, any request, be it launch or any other interaction, you can specify a payload. You can then get that payload if you look inside VoiceFlow for the variable called last event, then get the last events variable called payload. From there, we extracted the message if we had one and stored it in a variable called question and then spoke the question out and that's how I was echoing and doing some answers inside the knowledge base flow. I then came to the realization that I wanted to actually be using the intent system to be able to categorize what direction to go down. So is it an emergency? Is it a scheduling question? Is it a location question? Or is it just a basic question? And using the intent system requires having the information sent to you as a text interaction. So the way I solve this problem is that I actually have this system send a message that says system ready for question. And actually, I throw that away. So whenever I start a conversation, I'm actually doing two steps. First, I'm launching the conversation and getting that reply that I immediately throw away. And then I send the user's question as if they had sent a message, which then lets it get its intent categorized and go jump to that workflow specific, but otherwise is handled like any other interaction plus it has the bonus of automatically being added to the last utterance variable that we can easily use anywhere and added to the memory in case you wanted to have that for some reason. But in general, it's useful to know as a voiceful developer that you can both be sending payloads with the actual message itself, but also through the last event, which can sometimes help you send more useful information like the platform users on, their email or user ID if you're connecting to accounts on a website, for example. The next challenge we found is actually just getting good answers out of the agent. Here on screen, we see one example where I was asking it, can I 3D print? And it would give me a one sentence answer. You can 3D print up to three things at once. I guess that answers my question, but it's not super clear. and doesn't give all the information I want. I'd be pretty disappointed if that's the answer I got from a really advanced AI bot. What turned out to be the problem is that the basic knowledge base prompt, if you actually look at it from inside VoiceFlow, has instructions to keep its answer as brief as possible. So the solution to get more broad answers was to engineer that prompt a little bit more and explain to it that, hey, actually, you only get one shot to give your answer, so I want you to give the biggest answer you can that integrates all the information you have to answer the user's question the most thoroughly possible. And here on screen, we can actually see the great impact. 
the answer goes from maybe a two or three on five to a five out of five great quality answer that not only answers the user's questions, but also gives them all the information they could possibly want if they wanted to learn about 3D printing at Hack the North. The next challenge I encountered was bad filtering. Like you saw when we were walking through the knowledge base lookup step, there is a filtering phase that I wanted to add to make sure that people aren't trying to abuse our bot, especially not to have it writing code for us or any other things like that. The issue was is that it worked a little bit of the time, but very often I was having difficulties and it was actually blocking me on a question that I thought should be answered well. I tried multiple different times to re-engineer the prompt and explain my reasoning more clearly on what's allowed, what's not allowed. But then in the end, I got so frustrated with it that I just cut it out and hoped that any question that would be abusive or broken would just not be found in the knowledge base and the bot would just say, hey, I can't find the answer to that. In the end though, I talked to some people and actually realized that I should be asking the AI to give its reasoning behind its answer to maybe understand it a little bit better. And then it came to me. I had actually had some bad phrases that the AI was supposed to output. Because the way I'm able to figure out whether it's abusive or not is that I'm actually able to check the reply for a certain string. So here I was checking for yes or for no. And those are pretty vague variables. So the AI understood them differently to how I understood it. I took it as yes, it's okay, or no, it's abusive. But the AI on the other hand said, no, there's no abuse, or yes, there's abuse. And that was actually the issue that was found, right? There's a lack of alignment between me and the AI. So what I did is I explained it a little bit more and gave the AI some more obvious flag phrases to give back, like good answer or bad answer. And I put some symbols in there and then did a little bit of more parsing. And plus I told the AI to give its explanation so that its rationale is more clear, which is especially useful when its answers are wrong because that lets me see how did it misunderstand my prompt and what should I change so it can answer better. So once I made all these fixes, I've put it back in. And ever since I haven't really seen issues with this moderation step, so that challenge was resolved. The next challenge I encountered was around the buttons. As I mentioned, we don't want our Slack bot to have a state or to be looking up into the database a lot. But that meant that when it came to the buttons, I had to figure out two questions. Based on which button is clicked, how am I gonna figure out which record I should update in the database to say, hey, this is the answer? And how do I check that the user who clicked it is the user whose original question it was? because one of the requirements for the feedback step was that the only person who could give feedback was the person who originally asked the question. That might sound like a really simple solution, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that when your bot doesn't have any state. But the solution to the challenge was actually adding a payload to the buttons. So you can see on the code on the right of the screen here, each button inside of it has an action ID. This identifies what kind of button was pressed. And inside of that, I added a payload that's a string with two values. The first value was the user ID of the person who asked the question. So let's say Alex asked the question, it would store the user ID for Alex in there. Then it would also store the corresponding record ID inside the Airtable database. We didn't want to be reading information from the Airtable database, so I didn't want to look up like, hey, for this user ID or for this timestamp, what's the record? So I'm actually just storing the record in there with a line in between the user ID and the record so that whenever the button is pressed, I'm able to get the type of button and then extract the payload and then split it apart and check the user ID and the record. So that I could then say at Airtable like, hey, I wanna be updating this specific record without having to do a lookup before. The last little challenge I encountered was actually more of a logistical issue. I really liked this map module. When talking to my logistics team, they informed me that they weren't actually just gonna have one indoor map, they were gonna have a bunch of different floor maps. So the issue here was that the original setup wasn't made for this. It was just gonna serve one indoor map. We actually had an improvement happen late in the development of this, that if we want an indoor map, the AI is actually going to try and select a floor using some descriptions of what is on each floor and the text that was looked up and then show different people pictures of different maps. So for now, we don't actually have the map, so it's just numbers, but it's actually really powerful to give users high quality maps to answer the question they're using. And now that we've seen some of the challenges that were encountered and how we solved them, we're gonna take a deep dive into a couple of big features, starting off with how we handle sending questions from Slack to the bot and then getting the answer back from the bot back to Slack. So end-to-end -end for questions, whenever our app gets a message, so it's subscribing to any message that's sent in a channel where the bot is, it's going to check, is the message a question message? 
So this is sort of dispatching all the different kinds of messages that we're listening for. We're especially listening for questions, announcements, or knowledge-based insertions. Announcements and knowledge-based insertions are similar, and we'll talk about them in a second. But what we're doing is, if it's a question, and it's not in a thread, so we're sending it off to a function called handle user question, and send the message along with it. So from in here, we're going to add a reaction that shows a robot face to say, hey, we're pending. And then we're going to do some processing. So we're going to extract information about the message. And then we're going to send that first launch request to VoiceFlow with a function I wrote called VoiceFlow Interact, which just runs on the VoiceFlow Interact endpoint and then returns the answer. Then once we started the conversation, we're going to immediately send that follow-up with the user's question as the message sent through VoiceFlow. So message.txt is how we get their question. So that's what I sort of meant in the diagram when there's that first sacrificial system ready for message, and then we send the message instantly after. Once we do that, we also save the VoiceFlow transcript so we can look at it later for all those debug logs. And then we parse through all the traces. So we look, is this text? Is this images? We also handle the end reason, which is the last thing that will happen in all of our flows to diagnose what kind of topic. Did it go well? Did it go badly? Is there a score associated with this that we should be tracking? So we just handle that here. And then we're going to be sending the output text back as a reply in the message thread, which is, again, a little function that I wrote that just takes the message, the output text, and any attachments you want, and send it to the user. And then we're going to send a message to the monitoring channel for visibility. So we prepare this big monitoring message and then post it depending on the different types of exit reasons. So if it's an emergency, we'll send some sirens. If it's a failure, we'll send a warning sign. But if it's just success, we'll send this good check mark. And then we add some information to the Airtable. So we create a conversation record. This is, again, a function that I wrote that just takes in some information and then creates a record on Airtable. And then if it failed, we're going to send me a notification so that I can go fix it. And then the last thing we do is we send those satisfaction buttons which say, hey, was this a good answer or a bad answer? And in there, we're creating this button payload that I talked about in the challenge section that stores both the user ID and the record ID to be updated when they press the button. So we send those buttons along again in the same thread with the message and the button payload. And then after that's all done, we're going to remove the robot face that we're done handling the message. So that's end to end. We're hearing the message in Slack, sending it to VoiceFlow, getting VoiceFlow's reply, doing the processing, and then also sending the monitoring and the analytics to Airtable. Next up is the end to end behind adding announcements. So this starts off similarly to how messages are handled. So first we hear a message and then we're checking, hey, was this sent in the announcements channel? And is this not a thread? Again, we only want top level messages to be handled as announcements. If it is, we're going to send it to a function called handle announcement that takes in the message and also the channel it was received in. This is because we want to be able to handle announcements and announcement like insertions just the same. So if there's a discrete channel to also add announcements, we're just going to add the channel as manual insert so it can be distinguished differently. But otherwise, it's just the same function. So here from inside the handle announcement, it's actually not that complicated. We're adding that same robot react message so that it's showing, hey, I'm processing it. Then we're going to run a voice flow function that adds the information to the knowledge base. So this one's slightly different to the interaction. The first thing it'll do is it will call the knowledge base API and actually add some tabular data. This lets us have some additional information hidden as metadata and makes searchability easier. So we're just adding an announcement and the announcement will have the text that's said. And as metadata, we're actually going to store the time at which it was sent. That metadata is really useful because then we're using it later inside of VoiceFlow when we're looking up announcements to be able to label the announcement and the time it was sent together for more contextual information and so that we can sort uh, found documents. Then, once that's added, we're just going to do a little bit more processing to add a tag. That's a tag that lets us uniquely identify, hey, this document we just added, it's an announcement so that when we can look it up, we're actually prioritizing it over other types of documents. So here we just do that, and there's a little bit of retry logic in case it fails, um, but not that complicated. We're just adding a tag here, so the tags attach endpoint for the document ID, and the document ID, we get it from the add response. So like we add it, voice will tell us, hey, this is the ID for the document, and then we say, hey, you know that document you just gave me? Add a tag to it. Back inside the announcement handling, once we added it, we're going to have the response and the success. So we're going to assume that's a success. If it is a success, we're going to send a message to the channel saying, hey, by the way, I added your document. And if it failed to add it, you'll send a message. And if it succeeded in adding the document but failed to add the tag, it means the information is still there, but it won't be prioritized the same way as a usual announcement. 
So it'll tell them to reach out to me, the maintainer, just to update that and check the logs to see what went wrong. And then lastly, we're just going to remove the reaction message. But the most important thing is that this document has been added to our knowledge base and is actually instantly ready to go. Once VoiceFlow has processed the document, it can be found in any subsequent knowledge base lookups without having to republish the agent or anything like that. The last thing we're going to talk about is how we're handling analytics inside of Airtable. The reason we actually have this is so that after the event, we can have a large database of all the questions, all the answers, and do some more lookup on the time to respond, the cost, the success rates, the user feedback, and the answer quality ratings given by the AI. So other than just the monitoring channel, which is for in real time, we want to be able to look back at the database after. Before this, we need to be adding information to Airtable. So from our code, we actually have an Airtable script that I wrote that can create records both for conversations with a bunch of user information and for announcements with a bunch of announcement information. This is then being interacted with through the Airtable APIs. We could have used their SDK, but it just worked out fine doing it like this. And we have our own API key to be able to add it to our databases. Then once all these fields are added, we also have a different function to update the records so that once the user has pressed the satisfaction button, it's able to say, hey, this is how satisfied they were. We want to go update that previous record that we already had found. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the experiments we run that really leverage the analytics data sent to Airtable in the next video. We really powered through that last section, looking at how some of the features were implemented. If you really want a deep dive, full technical walkthrough with all of my explanations behind all the reasoning and scouring through every single line of code, look for the full hour and a half long walkthrough in the description below. Okay, now at this point, we've built out the solution originally outlined in our product requirement document. It works well from playing around with it, but it definitely needs to be thoroughly tested and benchmarked against our success metrics and prepared for actual launch. That's what we'll talk about in the last video of this case study series on deployment and iteration. We'll be talking about QA for AI products, debugging methods with voice flow, iteration, and preparing it for the actual real event. So I'll see you in video three. This video is looking at the third phase of building an AI solution, quality assurance, getting ready for deployment, and iterating. I'll walk you through the process of doing quality assurance for AI solutions that is maybe a little bit different to quality assurance for other types of projects, at the debugging process with VoiceFlow, the importance of monitoring analytics and experiments in AI systems, and then when that's all done, we're going to look at collaboration in a team for iterating on AI projects, and then finally getting ready for the day of the launch of your AI product. If you haven't seen the previous videos in this series, I recommend you go watch them first since we'll be building off them here. But here's a run through of the case study so far. Hack the North gets lots of questions from participants that could be answered by the documents we give them. We identified this as a problem that we could solve using retrieval augmented generation and voice flow by building an agent that can answer through Slack in one shot. We did a planning phase where we prepared a product requirement document and technical plan and met some stakeholders to iterate on the product requirements. And then in the last video, we went through the development of the actual product, some of the challenges faced, and we walked through some of the implementation of some of the features. And now we're finally ready to wrap up the project with quality assurance, preparing for deployment, and then launching our solution. So let's get straight into it with talking about quality assurance for AI solutions. So it's extremely important to do good quality assurance for any project, but especially when it comes to testing your AI solutions. That's because AI is a newer technology, we might not be as used to working with it, and often it's less deterministic than other types of programming. So when we're going to QA our AI solution, there's a couple of things we're looking for. Obviously, we're looking for correct technical behavior. It should be answering in the threads correctly. It should be sending the right monitoring messages and storing the right analytics. But more subtly, we're also looking for high quality answers out of our agent. We want its answers to be thorough and giving the user all the information it wants, as well as being completely accurate. We also definitely want to be focusing on good user experience. We want to make sure our bot isn't clunky to work with and that it's easy for organizers day of the event. Because at Hack the North, we can't be wasting organizer time. That's one of the requirements of this entire project is to be saving us time. So it's really important that it doesn't actually become a bottleneck. And we can only really evaluate the quality of the user experience by doing these tests. In our case, we also definitely want to see how the bot behaves in emergencies or edge case scenarios. That's often a problem with AI, 
where it might explain too much or do the wrong thing. And we want to be keeping our participants safe at the event in the case that they're using a Q&A chatbot during an emergency. The last thing that's really important in this AI QA is actually identifying missing information we haven't collected yet for our agent. Again, all its answers are based off knowledge we're inserting into the knowledge base. So if we don't have some information put in, we won't be able to get answers out. So through QA, both with artificial answers, organizer answers, and past historical answers, we're able to identify what documents were missing and need to be collected. So for this at Hack the North, we developed a thorough quality assurance plan and then sent it off to a bunch of our organizers so they could see what it's like to play the project and get their direct feedback on what features they want added or changed, any questions they have that aren't correctly answered, and collecting any other feedback that they might have. In this phase of the case study, I also put special emphasis on triaging issues between missing data and missing technology. So either bug fixes that have to happen, improvements in the voice flow agent, or more information I need to collect from different logistics teams or organizers. So when problems inevitably do come up, we need to be ready for debugging with voice flow. In our case study, we're able to debug in a couple of different ways. First of all, the monitoring messages were extremely useful. They let us instantly see after a question is answered, how well was it answered? Was it a success? Was it a failure? Was it an emergency? And it would also give us more information, like what was the exit reason, what path we went down, what score it was given, and a link straight to the actual voice flow transcript so we could look at it. Speaking of that, voice flow transcripts are absolutely your best friend. They give you all the information you need about your agent and how it went through the actual reasoning of the conversation, especially if you add a couple more debug logs. If you didn't know, in VoiceFlow, whenever you're looking at a transcript by default, it only shows you the messages that are sent. But in the top right, you can actually check a box up here to show debug messages. These messages show you all the reasoning that happens. Some of these are actually default logs sent by VoiceFlow, like this uh, KB set AI step that's made. So first of all, at the top, it shows you the intents that were classified. So here, when I just say test, it's just going to uh, give the none intent because nothing special happened. But then we know it's entering the smart announcement KB lookup. And we have some debug logs, so we can see that the malicious message was not malicious. We can see some paths it went down, some variables it updated. And in the end, we can see that it failed because the smart KB output was false. But actually, these are custom debug logs right here that I'm putting into my voice flow agent. You can do this yourself through a custom action. You don't need to write any custom special code for this. But all it is is I made a template in my template library called debug. It would have a JavaScript block that would set a string called debug message to a certain value. And I could use whatever JavaScript I wanted to actually set it. So here I'm just have a string and I insert some variables inside of it just so I can have some better context. And then I'd be sending a custom action. And all you need for this to work is take the custom action step out of this dev section, call it debug, put some squarely braces, quotes, message, colon, debug message, exactly how I have it written here. If you do the json.stringify, it'll actually already put quotes for you. So if it match exactly like this, you can add debug logs anywhere you want. So that's what's actually happening here after the smart announcement happens. It's going to create a debug message called smart KB output. It'll say the output status, and then it'll use this debug log to send it out. And that's how I can actually see inside my transcript. And that's what makes it really useful to know that here, the smart KB output was false and that we didn't find anything. And if it said I wanted something to come up when I sent test, I know I have to add a document for that. The last thing that was really powerful in this Hack the North Q&A case study for quality assurance and for debugging was the end reasons. These are logged pretty much everywhere, including the monitoring channel and inside the actual analytics that are stored in Airtable, but are really helpful to let us know what path did the agent go down. You can see these in the messages on Slack here, right? It says end type, answer fail, end reason, KB not found. But these are actually set from inside VoiceFlow with a custom action. So when we finish any route we go down, we either have this red step or this green step. This green step says answer success and passes from VoiceFlow to our Slack bot some other information. So it says that the answer was successful. And the reason it was successful is we actually found something in the knowledge base. So for debugging later, and we see a log that went wrong, and we see the reason is KB found, we can know that something happened in this path. This is also how we're able to attach the AI-generated score. And the scoring is really useful to be able to quickly filter out what kind of answers are good or bad, and which helps organizers especially investigate those really low quality answers with a score of one or two. 
I actually used all these debugging strategies together to solve a problem. So when we were asking questions about judging, we would ask it, when is submissions due? And it would keep giving us the wrong answer. And we weren't quite sure why. I had looked in the knowledge space, but there weren't any documents that should be that wrong. So what I actually did is I looked at the debug message in the monitoring channel, and then I followed through the transcript to look at what flow it had gone down. What I saw is that it had gone to the judging workflow because it was a question about submission times, and I guess that falls into judging. Then it had actually had a failure with the smart announcement lookup. And then I could determine that because the exit reason was judging good AI, I could know for sure that it had gone down this path, which led me to this hard-coded block. And I had realized that I had inputted the time wrong here. So thanks to all the debugging and monitoring that I have, it was way faster for me to find the actual cause of my problem. And I really, really, really recommend that if you're building a real-world AI solution, you consider monitoring methods like this. Put lots of debugging, put exit reasons, keep track of your transcripts and look back at them easily. But now that we've mentioned all the debugging, how do we actually know what's going on? Well, that's thanks to our extensive monitoring, analytics, and to the experiment that we ran. So as part of the quality assurance and iteration process, we were really able to play with a lot of the monitoring and analytics we've built out for this project. It was one of the core requirements in our product requirement document that we got out of our discussions of stakeholders who were a bit more concerned about the viability of this project and wanted to have a good eye on what's going on. So this product requirement came out as implementing a Slack channel for monitoring transcripts. In the final product, it looks a little bit like this. Every single question sent has a monitoring message sent associated with the success, their question, where it was sent, the link to go see the discussion if you wanted to contribute, also a link to the voice of transcript if you want to analyze what went wrong, as well as the exit reason in plain text to understand what path did it go down and a score. This allows us to do a lot of interesting things like notifying organizers when emergencies are detected or notifying the help desk when questions are failed to be answered by the automated system or have really low quality answers that come back. This is the extra work you need to put in for visibility to make an actual AI project ready for deployment. On top of this, for after the event, we decided we want to collect a lot of analytics to be able to decide, hey, was this project successful? Get some metrics on answering rate, cost to see if it's actually viable to repeat in future years. So for this, we implemented an extra system that we talked about in the development video. We're storing analytics in Airtable. It's a large database system. We're able to store records for every single question that was answered, the time it took to give the answer, the score, the exit reason, the user who asked it, and we're able to compile this for lots of interesting data. This includes an experiment that we ran. It's really useful to treat AI systems like this more like a science, where you need to run experiments to make sure that they're working well. So, I ran two experiments. I sent over 160 questions from one of our previous events to our AI system, and then looked at a lot of how they were answered and judged them myself for qualitative measures, but then also took advantage of all the analytics we have to make some graphs that sort of tell the story of how successful our AI system is. So here we see that it's able to automatically successfully answer 80% of questions. And in the data set we had, 7.5% of them were emergencies. So the only failures was actually 13% of questions, which is a really impressive metric to get out. We also saw histograms of how long it takes to answer. And we see that most questions are answered in under 10 seconds, which is 60 times better than what we had seen when it was manually being answered by organizers, where answer times are sometimes around the 10 minute mark. We also get some interesting metrics on what kinds of exit reasons there are. So what kinds of questions are people asking? This can be really useful as we're looking to improve the agent to see, hey, we should invest more time in this while we're iterating or more debugging, or we can look for correlations maybe. Hey, do we have a lot of failures in this specific flow so we can have some more nuanced data? And the last metric that's real interesting here is we can see the histogram of the process scores. We can see that the AI's answer quality is actually pretty good with a lot of threes, fours, and fives, and very few ones and twos. And these zeros are either failures or emergencies that were detected that we just don't grade. For a full description of the actual experiment that was ran, make sure to look at the end of the full walkthrough video. But the important takeaway here is that you yourself should consider how your organization can run experiments like this with past data. It was actually really useful for us to understand that our bot is working well and have more confidence that it's ready for deployment. As part of the deployment process, we need to make sure our entire team is ready to work with the agent. And that's when it comes to collaborating with a team on our AI solution using Voiceflow. So to get everyone on the same page, 
we wrote a voice flow handbook that could explain to our team members, hey, this is how the system works, this is what you need to know to be able to work with it, and especially there's a lot of information about dealing with the knowledge base because documents might have to be added or removed or updated. So explaining to our team members how they can do that is great. And it's also really great that with VoiceFlow, we can add lots of comments to our workflow so that everyone can sort of understand more accessibly what's going on to debug, make changes where they need, or just let your leadership and stakeholders understand the actual behavior of your agent. This is also really important because adding people to your VoiceFlow workspace lets them look at your agent's transcripts, which is really useful, as we mentioned before, for debugging. The last thing we need to do is preparing for launch day of. We made a copy of our entire project and created a bot to be put in the event Slack so it's ready to go. We've made sure to configure all the settings with all the pings and channels we want to be using. We cleaned up our database, deployed the Slack bot to Kubernetes, and did some last second quality assurance on the bot to make sure that it's all ready to go. Now we have a couple of weeks before the event's about to happen and we're pretty confident that this launch of an AI solution is gonna go great because of all the work we put in, in the planning, development, and QA and iteration phases of this actual project. And that's it. Congratulations. You made it to the end of this three-part case study. A retrospective will be out after Hack the North happens this year. So make sure to get subscribed to the Voiceful YouTube channel for that. If there's any videos you missed, either about the planning or the development of the project, you can find those below. And there you'll also be able to find the full hour and a half technical walkthrough that I did with the nitty gritty of how this project works, how the voice flow agent is laid out, and how you can set it up for yourself. It's been an absolute pleasure to share this case study with you all. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you around.